Good afternoon. My name is Cedric Herring. I'm a professor of sociology and public policy at the University of Illinois and the University of Illinois at Chicago. And it's my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to talk about some issues surrounding diversity, how it has changed from affirmative action, and how we now talk about it in terms of the business case for diversity. And what I'd also like to do is talk about how we can transform this concept into one that we can think of as being critical diversity. And I will, in fact, talk about critical diversity versus other kinds of diversity. Before I get started with uh, the bulk of my presentation, however, I'd like to thank Chancellor Shields and especially Shanita Ray for their invitation for me to be with you this afternoon. And hopefully I will talk about issues that are of interest and concern to people. And I will try to leave plenty of time for there to be uh, discussion, questions and answers. Uh, and things along those lines. As I suggested, the presentation will in fact focus on some of the rhetoric about inclusion and how it has shifted dramatically over the past 40 years or so. And uh, what I will indicate is that didn't know a sheet of paper could make that much noise, did you? Uh, in the 1960s, African Americans and others, uh, through the efforts like the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Power Movement, fought to end racism and racial discrimination. And what we see is that because of those efforts, there were dramatic shifts in equal opportunity policy in this country. The rhetoric um, shifted from neoliberalism to progressive kinds of initiatives. By the late 1970s into the 1980s, there was growing recognition within the private sector that legal mandates were necessary but insufficient in terms of actually bringing about real social justice and social change in this country. And so what we had was a movement toward the notion of diversity. Let me talk about some of the changing meanings of diversity. For some people, the term diversity provokes intense emotional reactions because it brings up such politically charged uh, ideas as affirmative action or even the notion of quotas. The idea of diversity is ambiguous. It is uh, ambiguous and this ambiguity is expressed in a variety of concepts uh, definitions that exist in the literature. We see in this chart, for example, that there are several, di several different dimensions of diversity and some that are extremely expansive where we're talking about how long people have been in this country, uh, things along those lines. Uh, when we get at its core, however, many times people are talking about demographic diversity, things along the lines of especially race and ethnicity, age, gender, national origin, and these kinds of uh, phenomena that we can talk about. Um, as I suggested to you earlier though, much of what we think about as affirmative uh, of diversity now was born out of conflict and strife in the 1960s and 1970s. And what has happened is that we have moved from this government mandate under the banner of affirmative action, which was in fact born out of, well, we can actually trace it back to um, even as far back as President Truman, but it was born out of affirmative action. And what we see is that the motivation differs for affirmative action versus diversity. Um, with affirmative action, Again, it was motivated by the law, legal mandates. Diversity, on the other hand, we can argue that changes are strategically driven to bring about benefits to organizations. When we're talking about who is targeted under the banner of affirmative action versus diversity, we see that there are, again, differences. Uh, when we're talking about affirmative action, there are selective mandates in changes of making sure that people gr from groups that are historically disadvantaged are included under the banner of affirmative action. 
What we see in contrast with diversity, however, is that it is this broader notion of inclusivity that, enco that encompasses everyone in the workplace or the school setting or things along those lines. We also see that they differ in terms of their mechanisms of inclusion. When we're talking about affirmative action, it generally assumes that there will be some kind of assimilation approach uh, and that there is the expectation that people who are brought into the system will in some sense adapt to the existing organization, the existing culture, and will assimilate. In contrast, when we're talking about diversity, it assumes that the diverse groups will devise new creative ways of working that will move beyond the status quo and that the people who are brought in in some sense will actually change the organization or change the cultural climate in which they, um, they find themselves. Also, when we're talking about desired outcomes, when we're talking about what is it that we're even aiming for with affirmative action, it is by and large aimed at changing the demographic composition of the organization or of the, the group that we're talking about. And again, with diversity, often, if not all the time, it is aimed at changing organizational culture and developing skills and policies that get the best from everyone. And we can say that affirmative action has reached its goal when in fact the doors of the organization have been opened up and uh, these underrepresented groups are now included and are more proportionately represented. Uh, with diversity on the other hand, we can think of it as having been successful when it opens up the culture of the organization. And again, also bringing about more inclusivity. What I'd like to do now is shift a bit and talk about some other aspects of diversity. In, in fact, what I'd like to talk about is the whole notion of how diversity moved from this, uh, under the banner of this civil rights effort that was born out of racial conflict and strife, and moved towards a business case for diversity. And so we had, uh, as I suggested to you earlier, we had this whole movement that said, uh, basically you had underrepresented minority groups who were saying that they needed to be included and they were demanding to be included. But we, 30 years later, are now talking about it being corporate America, corporations are, are, are around the globe who are indeed embracing the notion of diversity and often they embrace the notion of diversity because they say that quite literally diversity pays. And so the rationale is different. They suggest, at least these proponents of the business case for diversity thesis, literally claim that diversity pays. They suggest that it represents a compelling interest that will help meet customers' needs. And in doing that, it, enrich, it, it does this by enriching the understanding of the pulse of the marketplace. When you have different kinds of people who are in tune with uh, different kinds of customers, it makes it more, uh, it makes these companies more able to understand what their customers' needs and demands are. And, and doing that improves the quality of products and services offered to their customers. And we have the, the notion of having groups that you want to bring people in who think outside of the box with diversity because these are often people who are by definition outside of the box it brings different perspectives and broadens the outlooks and uh, strengthens the work teams and provides new perspectives and resources in terms of problem solving. And so we've heard many of these kinds of arguments about why diversity is good, why diversity pays, and these kinds of things. And so the bottom line with, with this kind of perspective is that diversity is good because it offers the promise of greater profits and earnings, especially for corporate America. But not everyone believes that diversity pays. And increasingly in American society, we have people who are in fact skeptical, very skeptical about 
diversity. And so we can talk about the, the perspectives of the skeptics of the business case for diversity thesis. These people say that when we are talking about diversity, we often overlook the significant cost that diversity has in any kind of organization. Now I suspect that if people uh, chose to come to this conference and chose to come to this particular session, you're probably not among those who are the super skeptics, but let me share some of their vantage points with you. They suggest that diversity, that is having people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different races, different gender groups, um, that this is often linked with conflict, especially emotional conflict among coworkers. And what happens as a result of this conflict is that it reduces cohesiveness of groups and results in an increased employee absenteeism and turnover. People say, well, there's just too much going on at work or at school. I don't want to deal with it. And if I have any opportunity to skip out, I'll just do that. And so for that reason, you get more absenteeism. And if people are really emotional, emotionally distraught, they will often even look for better or different kinds of work settings or school settings, et cetera. And so uh, skeptics of this business case would say that we often overlook these kinds of things that also are consequences of diversity. We also can talk about some of the 